Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome all audiences from different countries. Thanks for joining the international short course on nursing informatics. My name is Dar Albany, a lecturer at the College of Nursing, Howell Medical University, and a head of department at the Faculty of Nursing, Teaching, Teaching International University. And right now, I'm a master's student in nursing informatics at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. This international short course is fourth series of Tehran University of Medical Sciences School of Nursing and Midwifery Program on Nursing Informatics, which entitled of Professional Roles and Practical Application of Nursing Informatics. There was a session one, which was held on the 16th of August last week, which was presented by the Professor Maricia Wilson, a pioneer of nursing informatics, an associated professor of Alabama University of Birmingham. You are able to review the slide and video of this first session through opening the website link of the short course. Today, you will have a professor lecturer, Dr. Melody Ross. DNP adjacent professor of Franklin University and a nursing informatics specialist entitled The Professional Role and Practical Application of Nursing Informatics. The host of this program is the School of Nursing and Midwifery of Tehran University of Medical Sciences, Department of Medical Surgical Nursing. It's an honor to have you all there with us. So today we will have, the, as a moderator, a prof, assistant professor, uh, Dr. Asya Dervish, a lecturer and head of IT courses at the faculty. I appreciate and welcome Dr. Melody Rose, outstanding professor with brilliant nursing informatics experiences from the USA with academic teaching experience and publishing valuable nursing informatics books and papers. First of all, we will start with Victoria. Asya Dervish, a moderator and lecturer and the head of IT courses at this at the faculty. And uh, Dr. please, the floor is you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, audience from different countries, Iraq, Nigeria, UAE, USA, and as you see, Kuwait and many different countries. But in this program, we have a lot of participants. Thank you. And it's good we can spread the knowledge about nursing informatics with the help of outstanding lecturers, as uh, Dr. Melody Rose, uh, Professor Marisa Wilson, Professor Hepta, and Professor Sipes, and uh, Dr. Alzadi. I should appreciate all of them for all the support and the sharing knowledge and experiences. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Thank you again for accepting our invitation. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Dear participants, just for reminding you, please note that you are on mute. If you have any questions throughout the lecture, please write them in the chat box located at the below right panel. Our colleague will try to help with you. Uh, thank you so much. Just I want to have a brief bio uh, regarding the professor, Melody Ross. So this session will be entitled The Professional Role and Practical Application of Nursing Informatics. Uh, the, Dr. Melody Ross is a just a professor at Franklin University. She holds a DNP in nursing informatics, MSc of nursing informatics, registered nurse license and is an certified professional of healthcare informatic manage, uh, healthcare information management system through HIMSS North America with experiences in clinical informatics at Ascension Healthcare. Previous roles have include director of mid-teach clinical informatics at LifePoint Hospitals clinical informatics at Healthcare Corporation of America, HCA, and nursing supervisor at, at nursing supervisor at HCA. 
She has worked with NetTeach, Maxon Now, Alistrip, and Center of Electronic Health Record Systems. Some of her skills, including enterprise-wide clinical information system, HIPAA, security and auditing, healthcare information technology, leadership, healthcare counseling, EMR research, hospitals and hospital systems, healthcare management, ambulatory, CPOE, nursing, EHR, uh, technology, HL7, marketing, higher education. So Professor uh, Melodiros, we are all eyes and ears for your invaluable lecture, as it may take about 80 to 90 minutes. So please tell me if you want to, to if you want to have a break between the slides. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. That was a great introduction. I appreciate that. Let me see if I can get screen share to work um, and get set up. What I am planning to do is divide this lecture into two sections. All right, can everybody see my slides? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, so uh, I've divided this into two sections, and when I timed this, it was about 40 minutes for the first section. So I thought we'd take a little quick break after that and come back to the second part of it, if that's all right. Okay. All right, so um, it is so nice to be here, and uh, congratulations to you. And I'm also going to take down um, my uh, picture for now. Um, because it is morning here in the United States, and I have full glass behind me, and I don't want to blind anybody with the, the lights. Um, so let me see if I can um, just, there, there we go. So the brightness should be going away. Um, I, I want to congratulate all of you for your successful studies in this series of international short courses. So this is the fourth um, series of the Nursing Informatics Online Short Course Programs. And again, it is brought to you by the Tehran University of Medical Sciences. And I wanna thank Dr. Darvish for inviting me to speak to you today again. And it is a pleasure to, do, to be back with all of you. Um, I would also recognize um, all of the wonderful and talented colleagues at uh, Tehran University of Medical Sciences for the great work that they do in the promotion of health sciences, especially on the international stage. Um, what a great, great thing to be a part of. So let me start with a quick self-introduction. I am Dr. Melody Rose. I have been a registered nurse for over 37 years. I started my nursing career as an associate degree nurse, that's a two-year degree, and then waited for about 22 years to get back to school to pursue, pursue an advanced degree. Now in that 22 years, I worked clinically as a med surge nurse, telemetry nurse, ED nurse, a nursing supervisor, and a few things along the way. But also during that time, I had opportunities to work with computers. Now most of those opportunities came because I raised my hand and volunteered. In several situations, I was able to combine a computer job with a clinical job for a full-time position until nurses became recognized as needed in the world of informatics. And so in 2008, I went back to school and I bridged from an associate's degree to a master's degree, the MSN, with a specialty in nursing informatics. Um, I, I don't have a bachelor's degree, I bridged. I went from the two-year degree to the master's degree. So I, a bachelor's degree is something I do not have. That was a three-year program. I graduated in 2011 uh, with my master's degree and I immediately started working on my doctor of nursing practice, my DMP, and I graduated from, from that in 2014. So I've been asked why I waited so long to go back to school and I have a couple of good answers for that. The first answer is that until nursing informatics came along and was recognized as a pathway for nurses, there was really not a specialty field of nursing that I was truly interested in pursuing. Now, in 1996, I found out there was a certification being offered for nursing informati informatics. Uh, and I, I was very excited for that. And at that time, it was simply a, a certification. It wasn't a true pathway. 
Um, and I, I, I remember thinking that, wow, this is great. I, I can go for that. But then I looked at the, the minimum testing level and that was a BSN. And I only had the two-year degree, the ASN. And also at that time in my life, I didn't have the money. I didn't have the time. And I didn't have the support at home to go back into the classroom for a BSN. But 10 years later, online schools were available and I was at a crossroads in life. So I made a decision to go back to school in the online platform. I bridged from an associate's degree to the master's degree with a specialty in nursing informatics and then went directly for the doctorate, which I've already talked about. And I just want to make the comment, you know, that was uh, uh, in the uh, early 2000s when I went back with an online platform. Now look at us. We're in an online situation that that is global. So yay for us. We have uh, really expanded the opportunities of um, uh, online platform. So let's see if I can change slides here. There we go. So let's look successfully change slides. There we go. So let's look at some objectives that I want to talk about today. First, I want to establish the educational requirements for nursing and nursing informatics. We're going to talk about identifying the responsibilities of the informatics nurse, the IN, and the informatics nurse specialist, the INS, in the hospital. Um, We'll identify responsibilities of the IN and the INS in the out-of-hospital settings. We'll provide situational examples of the IN and the INS as they apply in the, those settings. I want to talk about application of telehealth and telemedicine. And I also want to talk about um, application of artificial intelligence in healthcare because that is now an up-and-coming uh, facet of healthcare. And I want to provide some insight for graduate level practicum projects. So regardless of the level of entry into nursing, nursing promotes lifelong learning. That's just the bottom line of nursing. And what this means is that we are always on the path of education, regardless of whether it's in a traditional educational setting, a practical education or the education of life. In the United States, there are three levels of entry for the registered nurse, the RN. These points of entry are the two-year degree. That's where I started, the associate's degree. The three-year-old, oh, the three-year degree, the diploma uh, nurse, and those are being phased out. And then the four-year bachelor degree, and that's what um, is being pushed in most areas in the United States is the bachelor's degree. Now, these, these all four or three of these degrees fulfill the educational requirement that allows a student to apply to take the, the licensure test for registered nurse. In the United States, the RN is licensed at the state level. Some states are compact states and accept the licensure of other states. Other states do not. So to practice in any state for a length of time, the RN must obtain a license in that state. So for example, I live in the state of Tennessee. Tennessee is a compact state. A neighboring state is North Carolina. So if I needed to go work in North Carolina for a short period of time, maybe I took a travel nurse job for two weeks uh, in the state of North Carolina. I can do that on my Tennessee nursing license. But if I wanted to go work in North Carolina for a year, I would really need to apply to the state of North Carolina for a North Carolina nursing license. So additional education comes in the master's degree program. And at that point, a, a specialty needs to be declared. And fortunately for me, nursing informatics uh, became one of those specialties. And then following that comes the doctoral studies le level. And there's, although there's more, we in informatics, we usually look at two areas of specialty. The research area is the PhD. The research application is the DNP. So as a DNP, I would take the work of a PhD and apply it in a clinical setting. So the expectations in informatics for the different levels of nursing practice kind of fall out like this. At that entry level, the RN, that can be a two-year, three-year, or a four-year degree, 
we expect to see at the bedside caring for patients, working with the providers, and dealing with the technology that is put in to meet regulatory standards. At this level, the expectation is communication with charge nurses, managers, clinical informaticists, that's me, um, administration of what, uh, and administration of what works and what does not work. Now, the sidebar of this situation is that charge nurses, managers, clinical informatics, administration, and others, anybody else that that might have a, a, a dog in the hunt, need to be making rounds with the bedside staff people and listening to their conversation. The bedside staff will tell you exactly what needs to be fixed, what is hard for them to use, what would make life easier. And within these conversations, bedside staff understand why technology was designed in a certain way, they tend to be more compliant and less likely to look for a workaround. So the informatics nurse, the IN, that have an, in, these are nurses that have an interest or experience in informatics, but no formal education. They are also typically at the bedside or possibly in mid-level management. These are the nurses that have raised their hands and volunteered to be trainers. They've been on committees, they've been involved in implementations and upgrades, and have shown an aptitude for working with informatics. Now, both the entry-level RNs and the informatics nurses are key in identifying problems at the bedside. Also have great ideas about what will make workflow easier for staff and have the ability to identify problems that will occur outside of the business hours and when I say business hours, I'm I'm basically talking about that Monday through Friday, nine to five, when administration is built uh, is in the building. So we're looking to identify those problems that occur outside of those um, business hours. So we're looking at off shift weekends and holidays, because the hospital still has to run, but administration is not in the house. So master's degree, um, the in informatics level. This is the where we go from informatics nurse to informatics nurse specialist. This is a nurse that has an advanced degree in informatics or a certificate in informatics. At this level, the informatics nurse specialist can identify problems at the bedside, can take this to com committee for responses. They can identify a workflow and they can evaluate if the workflow can be changed. They can identify the problem and uh, identify if it's related to informatics, to workflow, or both. They serve on appropriate committees and work groups that can weigh in on the issues. They can also be part of policy and procedure processes, and they recognize that change can be made, but changes have to be made with all stakeholders involved. Now, the doctorate level informatics nurse specialist can be based in, like I said, based in research or the application of research, the PhD and the DNP. And at this level, the informatics nurse specialist can identify if the problem is related with informatics or workflow or both, serves on appropriate committees, work groups that can weigh in on issues. They can be part of the policy and procedure processes. We hope they are actually part of the policies and pre, um, process, procedures. They can develop a research process to determine the best course of action. They can apply that research to current practice and they can assess and evaluate and, and communicate outcome of applied research. Now, I came from a clinical background. I found a love for nursing informatics and a way to apply um, this love at the bedside. I still work in that clinical setting. I work for a major, major healthcare corporation. And that's Ascension Healthcare in the United States. Um, I've actually worked for many healthcare corporations and I work as a clinical informaticist. Um, I work at the level of the clinician and this is my choice. I stand at the side of the care providers the nurses, the advanced practice nurses, doctors, and administrators. And I work with them to implement systems, evaluate the systems that we use, put in upgrades, correct things that are not working, fix things that people have told us 
won't work because sometimes they will with a little persistence and finesse and generally try to make informatics better for all involved. So let's do a deep dive of what hospital nursing informatics is about. What I wanna focus on today are some of the directions nursing informatics can take uh, an informatics nurse specialist today. So in the hospital, one of the important things that we do is education. All employees, doctors, nurses, ancillary services, mid-level licensed practitioners, they all have to be trained in the informatics systems of the hospital. So the major electronic health record, the EHR and documentation training gives the provider three and a half hours of specific how-to training on putting in orders, documenting medical notes, reading the medical record and navigating through the vendor products that come back into the system. Excuse me just a minute. So this has to be done for every provider, and this is by policy. Uh, every provider that comes into the hospital has to be educated uh, in the practices of the EHR. At my healthcare system, we have eight, soon to be nine hospitals in my market. And they range from very large to very small, but all the providers receive the same education. We also review electronic prescribing practices of controlled substances. This is mandated by law. All providers that uh, prescribe narcotics, controlled substances, have has to do this um, electronically. So direct, we don't hand a paper prescription anymore. It's transmitted uh, directly to the pharmacy. And the providers have to be trained on that. We also train them on voice dictation if they want to. Um, the voice dictation product we use is Nuance Dragon, and both the controlled substance training and uh, Dragon training, we have to interact with the provider and their mobile phone, which sometimes can be um, interesting. So some of the challenges this pre presents comes from in the form of providers that come into the facility in the capacity of locums. Locums are temporary providers that come in uh, to cover a shift or maybe a weekend of shifts. They still have to be trained. Some of them feel like they don't. Some providers don't want to come into the hospital a day before they start um, for training. We've been creative in finding ways to accommodate providers remotely when absolutely necessary. However, this has been the exception and not the rule. The expectation is a provider must be trained before they start working. Now, nurses also have to be trained. In my healthcare system, training falls to nursing as a division rather than my team. Nurses and support staff also receive extensive training in the EHR and are put in, uh, on the floor with a mentor uh, to help guide them and remind them of the specific areas of documentation for each patient. The ancillary staff, such as respiratory care, radiology, physical therapy, are all trained on the EHR in the same way, and a mentor is provided by the departmental staff. I mentioned administration, and we don't think of administration as people that would really need to know uh, how to document in the EHR. So there really isn't formal training, but I make sure that my hospital administrators are trained in ways in the EHR. Um, an administrator is never going to sit down for three and a half hours for training in the in the EHR, and they don't need to. But an administrator will read a quick reference guide, a QRG, that explains how something is done. So as an example, if a provider is complaining to an administrator about a process that takes too long, and I find out about it, or I get asked about it, I'll send the administrator a QRG that shows him or her the process the provider is complaining about. All of my administrators know how to read the QRGs I send them. 
So once employees of the hospital are trained, the clinical informatics department is responsible for the way the ER, EHR works for them. So if nursing has an issue, they call us rather than the nursing education department for troubleshooting. The same is true for providers and ancillary department. So let's move on to troubleshooting issues. Clinical informatics seems to get calls for everything. Our role has become sorting through the calls and issues, covering what is ours, and sending issues to the correct area if they're not ours. We also collaborate with others when issues are bigger than our area. Many healthcare companies have a help desk that will tick up most issues so statistics can be kept. An issue that I take care of has to go into this ticketing system so I get credit for the work I do. Most of the issues are going to fall into the first three categories shown on the screen, software, hardware, or technical issues. As an example of a recent software issue that happened last week when case management reported they could not print face sheets for patients, apparently they, having a face sheet is vital to their workflow. They had reported the issue and were told the issue was resolved. They called me because they still couldn't print a face sheet. Well, I went in and read the ticket, and I was able to tell them that the issue was caused by a server that had been down. The ticket indicated that the backlog for printing face sheets was expected to be caught up in three days. Well, three days didn't really help them today. So at that time, I suggested that they ask admission or the admitting department if they could run face sheets and print them for them through the time that it took until the backlog was caught up and that seemed to work for them. So this ended being ended up being a software problem caused by a technical issue with a secondary problem that that happened because the help desk did not communicate with the case managers in a satisfactory way and give them a work around through the issue until the problem was was resolved. I really didn't do anything um, to resolve the issue other than read a ticket, log, and provide the communication. But part of that um, role of the INS of clinical informatics is being a problem solver and collaborating with all the teams. Now, hardware issues are usually solved or resolved uh, quickly. We have a team in-house that can handle hardware issues. One exception to this is setting up and maintaining printers. Printers and printing seem to be the mystery process that no one can figure out. And the team that used to do that, this um, used to be on site that recently has been off site. So that kind of complicated the mix. Um, and we still don't have great answers to printing. So I want to take a moment and talk specifically about the three bottom issues listed on the screen. Those are downtime, emergencies, and disaster recovery. These are big areas. There are two types of downtime, planned and unplanned. Planned downtime is usually not a problem. That is until it becomes a problem. But in general, planned downtime usually goes well. I will encourage you to have an informaticist involved when downtime is planned. And this is why. Non-clinical people have the concept that hospitals do not really function after 8 p.m. at night. When a downtime of important clinical systems is planned for 11 p.m., it's really important for the clinical person on the team to say, but what happens when an MI patient comes through the ED and we have to take them to the cath lab, but the system is down for maintenance? The immediate response is usually silence because no one has thought about that scenario. Another time the non-clinical people like to schedule maintenance is for Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Well, this is one of the busiest times of the day for the hospital. The clinical person has to be able to say to the patient, say that the patient and patient care comes first. Schedule around the patient, schedule around the busy times of the day, and have a backup plan. Now, unexpected downtime um, is different. And we need to practice for this. And we also need to have a plan. So make sure you have a plan for unexpected downtime. Run drills, have mock downtimes. They don't take long. 
You just have to make sure that people know how to document if the EHR is offline. So ask yourself, can a nurse give meds if the MAR is not available? How would you get a copy of the MAR? Plan for unexpected downtimes. Now, emergencies are never good. So have a plan for an emergency and practice. Several years ago, um, there was a bomb that was set off in downtown Nashville on Christmas morning. This took out the phone communications in three states in the area. And some people, uh, for some people, and for the hospital system I work for, the hospitals could communicate internally, but they could not communicate between the hospitals. Now, my hospital system have, has two hospitals that are about a half a mile apart, but they couldn't talk to each other. We didn't have a plan for this. Nobody expected something like that to happen, but we have one now. How about disaster recovery? Now, this has taken on a new meaning in the last few years. Originally, disaster recovery was just how are we going to put information back into the system if we're down for a day, for three days, or for a week? Today, we have to think a little bit broader and think about cybersecurity and data loss based on hackers that have stolen information. Have a plan, be proactive, practice the plan. All right, let's talk about implementations. The electronic health record is always going to be the main product of the facility. You may or may not have been part of the original install team. Regardless, you will come to know and love the EHR as, as it becomes the base for everything else. And what do I mean uh, by everything else? Well, we have vendor interface products. So EHRs are good, but they're not always all-encompassing as we like them to be, regardless of what the EHR tells you. There are always going to be third-party vendors that do something extra that is not included by the EHR. Yet those third-party vendors products still need to communicate with and through the EHR. Um, areas such as lab and radiology are key areas that use many third-party vendors. So we help with those. Um, documentation areas uh, for specific service lines such as obstetrics, ED, and oncology are areas that you might find third-party vendors. These areas are unique in needs that generalized documentation may not meet. A third-party vendor can create specialty documentation that fits that area. Other areas that are not considered true EHR functionality but still contribute to the EHR or our areas of registration, bed management, and billing and charging. Now, bed management is an area that it has a huge influence as it is important to know where patients are in the hospital, how many beds are or are not available, and what levels of care are available. Scheduling systems, um, these types of scheduling Patients are they're used for scheduling patients for inpatient and outpatient procedures and surgeries. They have to be functional enough to consider the priority of the diagnosis of the patient, consider the outpatient that has traveled for a procedure, and if they can be put in in front of the inpatient that may be able to wait for a procedure. They also need to be able to prioritize exams that have to be done in a sequential order. Communications between staff and patients have changed in recent years. The telephonic systems that run over the hospital network system are considered to be private and secure. These communication systems work for patients to talk with the staff, nursing staff to talk with other staff, including providers. Communication can be done through a phone call or text messages. Now, orders still cannot be sent through a text message as there is not a saved record of the order at this time. But we can talk, we can um, text. The communication aspect is now being increased to include, include bed management, provider scheduling, and on-call schedules. Um, at my hospital system, we use Volt as the communication system. Another area that has become uh, a high priority is performance evaluation. Um, 
post-visit, it's important to know how the patient felt about their visit and if they would come back to the hospital again. Performance evaluation is an area that can be driven by automation based on certain criteria set up by the hospital. It is a very important area as satisfaction scores are competitive in healthcare. So let's move on to software upgrades. They happen. Um, they have to happen. Most EHRs have annual, at a minimum, upgrades that have a major impact on the EHR. For an annual upgrades, production and non-production environments need to be synced. And what I mean by that is they need to make sure that they are mirror images of each other. The upgrades go into the non-production uh, side first. They are tested and approved. If there are major changes that will need to be taught, the education will need to be worked through and presented to employees. If there are areas that third-party vendors are affected, these areas will also need to be tested and approved. It is not unusual to take up to three months to clear an EHR upgrade in a non-production environment before allowing it to go to the production environment. Communication has to be sent out in advance. Go live support has to be set up. And by the way, uh, on an earlier slide, I said this is that um, getting involved in uh, go live support is a great way to get started in informatics. So raise your hand for upgrade and go live support. Now, annual updates are com completed to meet changes that have been called for in documentation criteria, federal mandates security measures, new processes, things like that. Um, we will also put updates in the EHR more frequently as needed outside of the annual update timetable. This can happen if errors are found, a more efficient way to do something is found, a new mandate is identified, we finally get something fixed that has been a problem for a long time. We also have unplanned app updates uh, when an error is identified and needs to be fixed right away, usually the considerations are based on patient safety and financial impact. If there is an immediate patient safety concern, the fix can be put in right away. This is considered unplanned. If there are huge financial implications, fixes can also be put in right away. And then there's the emergent factor. Emergent is something that does does not happen often, but has happened. And I would consider many of the things we did for the pandemic as emergent. These were things that had to be done as quickly as possible. Lives were at stake, stake pay, it, you know, patient safety thing. But we also had to take enough time and look at the immediate ramifications of what was being done. In the first few weeks of the pandemic, we built new locations, new beds, new documentation screens, we had to build new lab tests, and we also put in triggers to remind staff about COVID-19. In several areas, we had to add complete locations as clinics to accommodate vaccine clinics and documentation of COVID-19 vaccine for non-hospitalized patients. The amount of emergent work that was generated by COVID-19 was amazing. Once the emergent part of this was done, we went back and looked at the non-emergent reporting processes that would need to be done. These were just as important. Emergent is always a total package deal. Emergent at the time, then go back and review from start to finish, looking for predictable ways to do better, clean up anything that was done halfway, and then look for long-term outcomes. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later towards the end of the lecture. So let's look at some of the roles the IN and the INS uh, can play in the hospital. Uh, I want to talk a little about the diversity in informatics nurse and informatics nurse specialist has in the hospital. We need to be included in everything as there is usually a complexity that involves informatics. So when we talk about committees, I want you to raise your hand to be on committees, especially if they are committees that are looking at workflow. You have the expertise of a nurse, 
and the specialty expertise of an informatics nurse. You see things from a perspective that many people do not. I've come upon situations that are almost complete and would have been put in as policy uh, for nursing to take on new responsibility when, in fact, nursing is not in a position to, to do the assigned responsibility. So let me give you a quick example of the situation I'm talking about. A vaccine information statement, a VIZ page, is supposed to be given to the patient every time a vaccination is given. The current workflow is for pharmacy to provide a VIZ page with a dose of vaccine. Pharmacy was not happy about this and they wanted to change the workflow. Pharmacy folks called a committee together but did not include nursing as part of the committee. The committee identified a new workflow that said nursing would scan the patient's armband, scan the medication, go to the computer and print an appropriate VIZ page and give it to the patient. The problem, besides trying to change the nursing's workflow without their consent, is that there were no printers in the patient rooms to print to. The workstations on wheels that the nurses use for medication administration and scanning are not set up to print to any printers. The dose of the vaccine to be dispensed uh, in the med uh, medication dispensing machine is a single dose pulled from a multi-dose container so it didn't have the appropriate identifier for the correct via, uh, viz sheet to print. So that workflow was not going to work even if nursing had agreed to it. But the point of this is that all stakeholders need to have a voice when committees make decisions, especially when workflow is involved. So be the voice of the nurse. I think I've talked about the importance of bedside nurses and staff. It's so, it is so important for someone and that someone is you to be making rounds with the staff to hear their com comments of what works well, what does not work, what changes can help. If possible, unit managers and administration should be making rounds as well. Rounding should also be done off shift and weekends and holiday, holidays if possible. Those times are when no one is around to support and when bedside staff end up getting creative to make things work. Every facility has a personality. Know the personality and the processes of the facility and know why that makes the facility run. If you know the processes of the facility, then you know the needs, what needs to be changed and why the changes need to uh, be made. Here's an example. Now, this is a non-informatics example, but I'm still going to use it. When I was a nursing supervisor, I worked mostly off shift and weekends in the hospital. And I the hospital was located in an area that was lower income and very culturally diverse. Some of the children in the area would come play in the hospital. It was a safe place to play. I noticed an older um, student, and by older, I mean high school aged, so uh, early teens, doing homework one day. I encouraged that student to go up to the cafeteria and connect to the hospital internet for their homework assignments. That student came back for about three months to study in the cafeteria. Now, I'm not sure what happened after the three months, but I like to think that I helped a bit and that the student was able to move to a better situation. Maybe they got internet connection at, at home by that time. But because I knew the circumstances of the area and some of the difficulties that, that um, children had with safety and students had with um, uh, connectivity, uh, I, I was able to help, I believe. How about policies and procedures? Be fluent with the policies and procedures of the facility. Knowing them tells you what you can and cannot do. This also gives you an idea of what needs to be changed and how. I cannot stress how important policies and procedures are and how important it is to have a scheduled system of review for policies and procedures. They should be available to all staff and the public. These are the standards that the facility is expected to follow. Um, project management. The roles and responsibilities of a project manager naturally adapt to nurses. In order to be a successful nurse, one has to be able to organize and prioritize work. Project management is simply organizing work by priority and identifying the necessary steps. 
to get the job done. Finding resources for the work might be a challenge depending on the circumstances, but once the resources are found, assigning the resources to work is part of the PM's responsibility. So I'm going to branch over into telehealth for a minute, and I'm going to talk about telehealth um, from two directions today, uh, but right now we're going to talk about telehealth um, in the hospital. So in the emergency department, we can use uh, telehealth uh, for decisions that can be made on whether a patient needs to be transferred to a higher level of care. If you're in a smaller hospital, you might be able to either keep the patient at the smaller hospital or transfer to a larger hospital through the, um, the decisions made through telehealth. The common areas in healthcare or in telehealth um, that we use this is neuro. Um, and, and determining stroke and stroke severity, cardiology, um, utilizing transfer uh, of cath results via uh, technology and telehealth. It's also uh, in the ED, we can use GI and sometimes behavioral health. Um, in, but behavioral health in general is another area that we can sometimes diagnose and provide treatment. Uh, there are parameters for treatment through telehealth, but it's a very useful tool for diagnosis and then providing follow-up treatment after initial treatment is done, especially since facilities for behavioral health are overloaded. Neuro. Neurology is an area that telehealth has impacted greatly. Outside of the emergency department, when a patient demonstrates uh, stroke-like symptoms, they can be evaluated quickly in the setting they are in for treatment or transfer. The nurse brings in the telehealth telemedicine computer into the patient's room, and a neuro provider can evaluate them, uh, the patient remotely. If the family is at the bedside, the neuro provider can also uh, speak with the patient and the family. Um, gastroenterology evaluations can also be done the same way. Uh, the telehealth uh, computer is brought to the patient's room. If the family is there, they can also speak. Um, patients and families have the opportunity to talk with the provider and make a decision um, upon a treatment plan based on the severity of the patient's condition. And then um, we also can man um, intensive care, complete intensive care units through telehealth. This is especially convenient for smaller and more rural settings that cannot draw intensive uh, care providers. Care can be given at the bedside by trained intensive care physicians through the use of specialized camera and monitoring equipment. Nursing staff report that uh, they received the care they get this way uh, from the doctor is more immediate than actually paging a doctor that is at home and has to come back or might be out in the hospital making rounds. So this is an uh, electronic ICU. So at this point, I'm going to branch out into the out-of-hospital application, but let's stop here for a minute and take a quick break. We should be at about the 40-minute mark. Okay, Thank you so oh, much. You're welcome. Okay. So this will be the break time for about uh, 10 minutes. It's, it's enough to clear. That's enough 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. For about 10 minutes, and we will be back late, soon, inshallah. Thank you so much. Yes, okay. Professor. Okay. Yes. See if I can get my screen back up. There we go. And uh, can we see the screen? Yes, it's clear. Okay, very good. So let's continue with out of the hospital um, applications. So um, in the realm of out of the hospital, um, telehealth, um, telehealth is considered a voice, video, text, um, type of applications and the value of telehealth seemed to come of age during the pandemic 
the convenience and safety of, te of telehealth was realized during the lockdown time, the time when uh, people were advised to social distance and to especially not go into a doctor's office um, if they were not sick. I know that's a double negative there, but don't go if you're not. Um, so why would people go into a doctor's office if they weren't sick? Well, they would go in for routine checkups, um, for visits that were medication management. Uh, and these all had to continue during the pandemic, but we realized that we could do this through telehealth. Um, we also uh, can do device management and by device management, things like pacemakers and other devices, impulse generators, um, devices that are monitored, especially devices that are monitored and patients simply need to, needed to have a wellness check. Um, those can be managed uh, through telehealth. So telehealth and uh, telemedicine visits for device monitoring can be uh, a device that's synchronous or monitored at the moment or asynchronous uh, monitoring that is recorded monitoring and reviewed later. Um, some of the common applications of, te of telehealth are test results and, and then uh, uh, treatments based on those results uh, where your doctor calls and says, hey, you're, you know, we found this, we're going to do that. Uh, medication management, routine follow-up, or post-office visits. Um, we also do uh, urgent care um, visits can be done uh, through telehealth. Um, I do want to call attention to care for rural and remote areas. Telehealth and telemedicine visits have come to the rescue um, for this, this uh, population. In some areas of the country, people travel a day to get to the provider, spend a day for the appointment, and then travel a day back home. So three days plus two nights on the road uh, accommodations for a doctor visit. So putting this into perspective, what about a teenager that has severe acne and the doctor wants to start um, the patient on a drug such as Accutane? Well, that, that's a pretty strong drug. The provider generally wants to, a follow-up appointment within a week to check on the progress and potential side effects, and then the patient will need to return monthly for checkups and prescription renewals. Well, if the visit was a three-day visit and uh, three-day and two-night away from home, will this teen uh, get treatment for acne? Probably not. That's a pretty big commitment. But if the initial visit was made as that traditional visit and then follow-up visit can be made through a uh, telehealth or telemedicine, this is a much more likely scenario um, for the teen to get treatment. So a barrier has been removed. So I want to call your attention to a few statistics. 84% um, of providers uh, report using telemedicine at least weekly in their practice. Telemedicine adoption by physician age, the age group of 30 to 39 year old, is the highest adopter of telehealth telemedicine. Providers agree that telemedicine has increased patient access to healthcare, allowing patients uh, that have barriers of getting to the office uh, access. They also agree that telemedicine has expanded their community reach and referral networks. So I gave you an, uh, a scenario of a, a rural um, and remote area, but what about those places that are not rural and remote. So think of a, a huge city. Um, my daughter lives close to New York City and we go to the city every once in a while. Um, there are people that are isolated inside of New York City that can't manage the barriers of transportation. Think about an elderly patient that has mobility with a, a device, a walker or a cane. That person would has difficulties um, navigating uh, with buses or with uh, um, subways, even elevators and stairs are a problem. Or how about um, a mom that has a sick child, but she also has two or three other children and would need to take them um, via bus, subway, even walking down a busy street with several children would be a problem. Well, telehealth and telemedicine can um, help uh, remove barriers for healthcare for those, uh, those situations. Uh, telehealth can also bridge the gap um, the patient may find between leaving the hospital and the next provider office appointment. If the patient needs something, a telehealth visit may be just the thing 
that identifies the need for an immediate visit or calms the patient down and reassures that all is well. We also figured out um, that many of the pre-hospital activities such as registration, consultations, and things that are done in pre-surgical appointments could be done via telehealth. Along with this, many support groups also recognized the value of telehealth. Groups such as trans, uh, transplant support, diabetic support, heart failure support, all of these groups offer education specific to diagnosis and began offering this as telehealth during the pandemic, and this continues today. Many providers and clinics offer offices began offering telehealth visits during the pandemic. These visits continue today, and we have learned that they are valuable and viable uh, in treating patients. Special payment allowances were set up during the pandemic, so reimbursement was paid the same as an office visit. This has continued post-pandemic. Um, let's talk about vendor sales. Uh, informatics nurses and informatic nurse specialists are not limited to working within the confines of the hospitals or provider offices. Vendor sales in areas that actually develop products are very lucrative and valid um, for areas of employment. No one can talk the talk or walk the walk of a nurse except a nurse. Nurses have great ideas, and there are many startup companies that need informatic nurses and informatic nurse specialists to help promote and implement products. There are also current companies, big name companies that are experienced, that need experienced INs and INSs to help with sales and implementation of their products. Nurses that have informatics backgrounds combined with their knowledge of nursing workflow may be the best stakeholders to solve those long-term problems that keep hanging around but never get resolved. Um, I give you medication reconciliation. MedRec at the time of admission, MedRec at, at uh, discharge, and that's home MedRec, and then complete medication reconciliation in general is a huge problem. If this issue could be resolved, it would be a great patient satisfy, satisfaction. It would improve patient safety and readmissions to the hospital in certain instances, plus make the life of the nurse much easier. So I want to talk about um, EMRs, electronic medical records. In the, I use the term EHR, electronic health record, as the hospital or provider office record for each visit a patient makes. The term electronic medical record, or EMR, to me, is a combined record of all of these visits in one place. If the patient is fortunate, the EMR is in one place. My patient portal, or a patient portal, my personal providers are spread out and do not subscribe to the same healthcare network. So I have different portals to look at and multiple e EMRs. That's not necessarily fun for me. There has been movement from non-healthcare vendors to create a single EMR that would combine all pa patient accounts into a single portal. That was tried in the early 2000s by both Microsoft and Apple, and the efforts failed. 20 years later, Attempts are being tried again. It's always in the best interest of the patient to be involved in their own EMR. Know, know what's in your EMR. Be able to communicate with a provider, provider or pro providers through the EMR. Um, in addition to this, Google and Amazon are both working on search engines that will help patients and providers search through the EMR in different and easier ways. I've worked with the Google, Google folks with their product, um, Google Care Studios, for the last couple of years. I like that product very much. It's an easy way to search. It provides a great view of multiple encounters, and it allows the provider to search as uh, if they were searching on the internet. It's very intuitive uh, product. Other notable big retailer uh, in entries in healthcare are companies such as CVS, Walmart, and Walgreens. Now, these guys have a history of pharmacies, but they're now also expanding into clinic settings to see patients for routine visits. It's sometimes easier to get into a clinic for a sore throat than it is to your uh, own provider at the last minute. 
when I call my provider and tell them I have symptoms of a sore throat, elevated temperature, and I just don't feel good, they usually tell me the next opening is ne next week on Thursday. If I call the, the uh, clinic, I can usually be seen by a mid-level provider that day. So what am I going to choose? I'm going to choose the mid-level provider. So everybody's getting into the um, the clinic, the telehealth uh, arena. All right, artificial intelligence. This is a new or newer facet um, that's climbing into healthcare. There are many definitions and, and interpretations of artificial intelligence, but I like to consider that AI is simply the use of machines and software programmed to collect data and assist with data-driven decisions or judgments. In healthcare, AI should never be allowed to make a decision or judgments without the overwatch of real people. A machine, which is to me a computer with applied software, is only as intelligent as the information or programming that has been provided. So what's the difference between computers running data and presenting uh, data analytics and artificial intelligence? Interpretation and outcome after the interpretation. Now, if the truth is told, we've been using AI for a long time. When I call my local pizza place, I now go to an artificial intelligence a uh, computer that tells me what I ordered the last time I called in. And then it tells me or asks me would I like to order the same thing um, by placing an order with the machine. And if I do, most of the time I, I'll get 5% off of the total price just for not talking to people. And I'm usually good with that. I like to save money. But the other side of that coin is what happens when I call my cable company and I need to re review something on my bill and I get into their automated um, or artificial intelligent, intelligence um, system. Well, I would sincerely like to change the terminology from artificial intelligence to unbelievably stupid and irritating, not customer-friendly service that does not let me talk to a human be being and eventually hangs up on me because that's what happens. This type of artificial intelligence, although it fits into the category of AI, is not friendly and needs to be thrown out the window because it is not helpful. So using artificial intelligence in healthcare is starting to gain traction and has been shown some success. Currently, I'm working on a project that is a form of AI that will go out and gather re results of labs, cardiology results, things like EKGs, echoes, cath lab results. It'll gather radiology results and provide an overall recommendation to the cardiologist. Now, recommendations is the key word here. Like I said, in healthcare, all AI needs to have human intervention. But what I see as a more serious advantage to AR or AI in this project is that the AI program will go out and fetch the predefined elements that the cardiologist needs to make the comprehensive decision. Um, and it will do this by scanning several different areas. It will go into multiple EHRs. So this will bridge across multiple platforms. What the, the product cannot do is factor in elements that can be uh, historically applied for uh, as considerations or as wisdom. So, for example, if the patient's electrolyte values may be off because yesterday he or she ran in, uh, uh, did heavy exercise, or maybe even ran in a uh, marathon and became hydrated, dehydrated, uh, AI wouldn't be able to uh, account for that. What if the uh, recommendation came by came back that the patient should be started on an ACE inhibitor for control of hypertension. But nowhere in the historical encounters did the computer see that the patient had actually been put on a trial of ACE inhibitors and failed that trial and really needs to be put on beta blockers, things like that. The artificial intelligence is a tool that has been developed to higher levels every day. 
It only knows what it knows, though. AI is now available to end users like you and I on a personal level. We have software that will help organize our daily lives. It will help us find recipes. If I decide I want to uh, eat some kind of a chicken dish for dinner tonight, I can tell my AI friend what I want and it'll send me a recipe. It will tell me the best place to buy groceries and give me the address of the cheapest place to buy them. The same program, when given necessary criteria, will go out and search for resources for my next writing assignment and even write the paper for me if I let it. Now, most AI writing systems are detected by plagiarism detectors such as Turnitin, but there are a few very good systems that will pass detection, plagiarism, plagiarism detection. So do we fight AI or do we embrace AI? Do we work smarter or harder? I would not let an AI program write for me, but I would let AI gather resources for me. Now, that doesn't mean I won't look for resources on my own, but I will accept an AI assistant working for me. Okay, I want to uh, give you some examples of what clinical informatics does. And these are actually things that have happened to me that I've encountered. Um, so um, auditing. Many years ago, uh, this was in the first um, program that I ever worked in. We had a nurse that showed up for work um, and had been working for a couple of weeks when she was diagnosed uh, as positive for TB. She didn't have many symptoms, but she came back with a positive TB test. So we needed to find out how many patients she actually came back uh, that she'd been contact, in contact with. And this was in the late 1980s, so we were not heavy users of computers back then. Um, patient assignments were actually recorded electronically in the, in the hospital I was working at. So I was able to go back and audit the system and get back to administration in about an hour with a list of patients that the nurse had been assigned to. Now, this amount of time um, that I was able to do this was amazed, uh, just amazed my administration. So that was a very good situation. And if you consider that was um, 35, almost 40 years ago. Um, another situation is an audit situation. We had a, a nurse that was hired um, with an out-of-state license. And she was working long-term here in Tennessee, so she had applied for her Tennessee license, and she had 60 days to get that license in place. Well, something happened with the paperwork, and she missed the 60-day deadline. After the 60-day mark, any patient the nurse came in contact with was uh, at risk to not or to have payment denied to the hospital by Medicare. And more than that, if Medicare uh, denies a patient, then other insurances will deny the patient. And it wasn't pa just patients that she was directly involved in her, her uh, their direct care. It was any patient that she would have walked into the room even to refill a water pitcher. So I was asked to audit the nurse and come back with a list of patients that the, the nurse had touched in some way. And this was a short process because this was this was only about 20 years ago. Um, it took about 15 minutes to return the uh, the list to administration. Um, Jump to a couple of years ago when COVID-19 uh, came in and we had to do contact and trace auditing reports. Now these were done both on the providers and on patients, providers and, and um, employees. As contact was made, the reporting was also sent. This reporting was also sent to the county and state uh, regulatory boards for uh, local and statewide reporting. And then the state of Tennessee reported our results along with other facilities nationally. Um, now, I have to admit, this report was already written. I just ran the report, and so did my coworkers. But if you remember back to my discussion about emergent software upgrades. 
um, and going back and looking to what had been done and potentially cleaning up, this situation fits the cleanup scenario. As soon as we built all the new locations and beds for COVID-19, we knew we would be needing a report. <clears throat> this report was built as part of the COVID-19 tracking effort. So safety at the bedside, we depend on the bedside staff to identify areas in need of improvement. And sometimes these are actual errors. Sometimes they are near misses. So an ICU area, this was in the hospital that I uh, served as a nursing supervisor as um, most recently. The ICU nurses noted an acute increase in the MRSA uh, levels in their patient. And this was a new trend. This was not typical for the standard of care of this unit. This was a very good unit. So this was brought to the, uh, the attention of administration. They were very worried about this. Quality risk jumped on board. Informatics stepped into the situation, nursing council, and anyone else that could have uh, had an interest in this. After compiling a list of affected patients and looking through the charts, Informatics noticed that all of the patients had been on um, ventilators. So at this point, respiratory care was brought into the conversation. Very quickly, the discovery was made that a change had been made in the ventilator cleaning processes that included a new cleaning solution. The process was changed back and the infection rate eventually returned to what was termed as normal. And this is an example of a great body of work this started with bedside nursing and identifying a problem that was a patient safety issue. Informatics was quickly able to help identify the specific audience involved uh, to help reach a solution. Um, I want to talk about waves for a minute because this is a project that I just finished. This is an impl implement implementation of a better way for staff to log into a device for patient care. I was making rounds with one of my administrators last year. And actually this was the CEO and I've never made rounds with a CEO before, but we were making rounds on a Wednesday evening, I think it was, and it was about eight o'clock at night. So a great, admin, great um, example of an administrator getting involved in an off shift rounding situation. One of the patient care techs came up to us and asked about a different way for staff to sign into the Welch Allen vital signs devices, and I have this abbreviated as WAVES because it's just fun to say and much easier. These are the portable devices that the techs roll from room to room. They take vital signs for each patient. Each patient has their own disposable blood pressure cuff that stays in the room with it, with them. So when the tech gets into uh, a gets into room, they barcode scan to identify the patient by using their patient armband. She pointed out, the tech pointed out that each employee has a barcode ban a barcode on their badge. Her question was, why can't we scan the uh, badge to sign into the WAVES device instead of manually entering their 10-digit employee number? And she made a very good point. After investigating the situation, I found out that this had been tried before and it failed. Essentially, I tried a little harder and got the employee barcode scanning to work. This makes the patient care tech's life much easier. It took me about four months to implement the process throughout the hospital. It was just me working to get this done all uh, throughout the rest of the hospital. Eventually, I got waves in, in place. I was doing rounds one day and found a patient care tech on the fourth floor that usually uh, works in the ED. So I asked if she was able to get her badge to scan while she worked on the fourth floor and, and she didn't know me but her response was oh are you the one I have to thank for making my job easier and that was enough uh she just that comment just made my day because I realized at that point what we had done uh, a combination of administration myself making rounds listening to a bedside caregiver had made a huge impact I want to talk about centralized monitoring for a minute because these are both informatics um, initiatives. Um, we use centralized monitoring in two areas, um, telemetry and cameras. Um, my hospital, my 
market of hospitals includes eight hospitals. We have one telemetry monitoring location that will monitor all eight locations. And then we use the, the Volt communication system for the um, monitor text to call the nurses. Um, this works well, but we do have problems in that uh, there are actually the same problems that we had when telemetry monitoring system was in the hospital. The nurse sometimes doesn't pick up the phone. The tech sometimes doesn't call. If they do, um, the warnings are not heated. But the technology works. We can monitor um, remotely from miles away and uh, have a centralized station. The same is true of the centralized camera system. This is a little bit larger program. It spans more than one market. We have a centralized monitoring location that is out of state. I think it's actually in Alabama. Uh, but it visually watches patients that, we, that have been identified as threats for falling, for self-harm, for escape, or other tasks. This monitoring system works well, except for um, the fact that sometimes the, the techs don't call, the nurses don't listen, but these are the same issues that we have had when the uh, monitor techs were in-house. So technology works. Okay, now I want to branch over into the practicum capstone projects that uh, an MSN program uh, could have. So the practicum and capstone courses are the final coursework that show off the work of the MSN student. This is meant to showcase your accomplishments. You work with a preceptor on site and your uh, practicum or capstone advisor. Now. I, I'm using practicum and capstone. Each school is going to be um, unique in what they call their coursework. So that could change. And it's just what I'm used to. You will keep a, a log of time in your project over the course of the, the um, practicum and capstone. And this will include the planning that you do, the meetings that you have, the training, the conferences, any kind of education, you'll receive a list and you'll have to meet a total number of hours that's predefined in your handbook. Things that you cannot include are things like travel time. You cannot be paid for your practicum capstone time. Uh, now, if you uh, go on for your doctoral level, this changes, you can be paid for that. You provide a project that is mutually beneficial to um, both the facility and to the student. And the completion of the practicum capstone is not always completion of the project. So let me see if I can give you a couple of examples. Um, so my practicum capstone at the master's level was electronic modified early warning score. This is a tool that can predict a patient's significant decline in health up to eight hours in advance. It's based on a scoring system that looks at blood pressure, respiratory rate, heart, uh, heart rate, temperature, oxygen saturation, and level of consciousness. Now, each element is, giving, is given a score based on, on, um, on value. The total, if this total score goes up five or increases by two, it's an indicator that this, the patient might have a sudden change in condition. These scores can be automated in the computer system and then auto-calculated based on the MUSE algorithm. My practicum in Capstone was putting the pieces of this in place in a hospital so the hospital could implement the process. In evaluating, I evaluated their computer system, provided the needed programming, provided the education, and I provided a support model. My practicum Capstone ended for EMUs was implemented. Um, they had all the tool, tools they needed to put this in place. I just defined my capstone because I knew how much it, it um, time it took to actually implement. I knew I wouldn't have enough time in the MSN program. Now, as a side note, I was so confident, confident in EMUs. I also used this as a basis for my doctoral practicum project. 
Um, EMUs had been implemented in the hospital that I was working at as a nursing supervisor, but it had never been taught to the staff. So at the doctoral level, I re-educated the staff. I did pre and post education statistics and was able to show an improvement in patient outcomes. So the moral here is that if you're thinking about going on for doctoral studies, think about combining a master's and a doctoral topic um, for both levels you might be able to actually complete your master's project in a doctoral uh, program. Anyway, um, the next uh, project, this was a student of mine when I was at Cumberland University. So I was the faculty um, preceptor for this student. She uh, wanted to put AEDs in the Florida County public schools. Um, she was a public health nurse in Florida for a county in Florida. Her desire was to educate the local middle and high schools in the use of AEDs. She was able to find funding for AEDs in the schools that needed devices. Plus, there had been a recent event uh, where a, a student had suffered a cardiac-related event that could have benefited from the use of an AED. Her project was providing the planning and educational materials education and timeline. Um, Florida schools are not open year round in Florida. So she was not able to implement this when she graduated because um, the schools were out of um, out for the summer. Um, but she did leave the county schools with a complete plan on how to implement the AEDs and how to use them. The last project I want to highlight was a or is a project that just completed in December of 2022. And in this project, I was the preceptor on site for the student. This student um, uh, project was done just recently and was completed by the end of the practicum capstone uh, time. So this one actually was done. Um, our trauma team at St. Thomas Rutherford um, asked for a homepage as a one-stop shopping type of place for all of their employees to be able to go and find things. Um, our trauma team frequently had locums that would come in and cover um, open slots. So they needed to be able to find things um, that were unique to our hospital and not just trauma. So the student was shown a couple of existing home pages for different departments and then designed a, and populated a home page for the trauma team that included things like the mission statement of the hospital, profiles of the trauma team members, links to policies and procedures for the hospital, links to current trauma procedures, um, links to the trauma group, the vendor group that owned the trauma team links to frequently used resources like TEG, Dynamed. Now, once the, the uh, home page was created, the second part of this uh, that was sort of an add-on is that she, the home page was created and then she presented it to the Ascension National Domain owner for ED and trauma for use throughout Ascension. And I believe that will be adopted. So that was a great project for her. Um, so that is all I have for you. And, uh, at this point, I will take any questions that you might have. Okay. Thank you so much, dear Professor Mila Garros. Thank you so much for your very informative lecture. And, uh, I hope that uh, the chat box is open on your side. Now it's the time of the question and answers, dear participants. If you want to speak, please raise your hand. We will activate your mic and you can speak. Otherwise, write your question in the chat box. So we are waiting for your question. Uh, dear professor, before that, I want to ask a question if you have time. Uh, based on, on your experience, uh, how you expect the uh, percentage of the technology error in AI during the healthcare? Um, can you rephrase that a little bit for me? Yes, I mean the uh, medical error percentage during using the uh, 
uh, AI or any technology in healthcare. So in healthcare, whenever we use AI, the expectation is that there will always be human oversight. Um, so we use it as a tool. Um, we don't let it truly diagnose anything or direct any type of treatment um, without some kind of human intervention. Uh, if I've been so interested in this topic, I watch it closely and I'm actually working with a company right now that's, that's, uh, taking a step further developing AI. Um, so I, I'm deeply interested in this, uh, because I think it has a lot of potential, but I'm in fear that someone's going to say, oh yeah, just let it go and we'll treat the world through AI. And I, I just, I, I don't want that to happen. So human over, overlook is, overwatch is what I'm looking at right now. Um, and did, did that answer your question? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay. Okay, thank you. We received a comment, I think it's from, from Nicoli. Uh, say that that's a great use of telehealth. Minutes count when there is a concern for a stroke. Patients in rural areas often arrive outside the treatment window for PPA administration, having yes. access to tele, te, yes, to tele neuro at smaller community hospitals will, uh, will drastically improve patient outcomes. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And a lot of the smaller hospitals have, um, they can administer drugs like TPA um, and then they can transport if, if their transport is, is um, um, able to transport with TPA on board. I'm actually working right now on a dissertation committee for a, uh, a PhD student. And she, her dissertation is regarding telehealth at the ED level and looking at um, the ability to transfer and save money because there's so many ED patients that are being transferred inappropriately. Um, so it's not being used as it should. Um, it's a convenience, uh, oh, let's just transfer. And telehealth would actually sort out the best time, uh, the appropriate patients to transfer and leave the patients that don't need to be transferred where they are for the best level of care. It's also a convenience to families if they don't have to travel to the bigger cities and spend nights in hotels to be with their patient. So, Yes, exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a question from Hi Mr. Haider. Uh, he said that I do have a question. Do you believe that in the future we will be able to make AI consider the patient's history? No, I don't. I don't think we will be able to get AI to have wisdom. I think there's always going to be the element of um, human overwatch. I think historically, maybe maybe in 50 years, we can because we can control today's documentation for tomorrow. But yesterday's documentation was not designed for wisdom, if that makes sense. Um, we did a lot of narrative documentation historically, and it's hard to pull um, the historical elements that would give us wisdom or would give a, a machine wisdom, the ability to say, um, oh, I see that that trial of an ACE inhibitor, or I see that the patient has already um, uh, tried hemodialysis and didn't do well on it, so they only uh, can tolerate peritoneal dialysis. That's all narrative documentation from yesterday. Now, today we can put that in a different data source for tomorrow, but not in the near future, no. My opinion. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Mr. Tishki say that are we can add another aspect to nursing informatics like nursing research? Yes, 
there are. Um, there are many aspects. Um, nursing informatics, especially if you go to the, the newest um, scope, uh, standards and uh, scope of um, uh, nursing practice and uh, I have the book over there. If I, my arms were longer, I could hold it up. But the ANA scope and standard third edition goes through all the different aspects of um, what nursing and informatics is. Um, research, uh, genetics, genomics, um, data collection, um, reporting, data writing, how you frame questions when you write a screen. It, it, there are so many nuances. And you can pick your poison and specialize in it. Whatever you like is out there. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Shkur, say that what are the differences between associated degree and bachelor degree in nursing education? Okay. Um, associate's degree is two years, and that's what I started as. So my goal was get my two-year degree and get that RN paycheck. Bachelor's degree is four years. The difference um, between those degrees is a lot of the education the, that taught how to um, uh, home health, um, how to write a paper efficiently, the, the softer degrees, but you still end at the same point. I, both a two-year degree and a four-year degree still are eligible for an RN. Okay, uh, I think the last question will be from uh, Mr. Abdurrahman. Thanks for informative presentation. I do have a question. Do nurses nowadays face any challenges when implementing and ad adopting new informatics system and how these challenges can be overcome? There are a lot of challenges for, um, for the nurses today. And I, I would personally say um, that many of the challenges are created for the nurses because workflows and processes are not, uh, don't include the, the voice of the nurse. Uh, we have a shortage of, uh, of nursing representation when a process is created. So the nurse is not always considered. And I go back to the example of, of where the pharmacy wanted nursing to print from the bedside. Um, I go back to the example of the patient care tech that said, oh, it would be so much easier if we could just barcode uh, scan our badge. Those are the small things that make a difference. People don't consider the actual workflow of the nurse. How many times do we walk up and down the hall? And as nurses age out, if you read the journal articles, um, I'm in that baby boomer age. I'm the last generation working. I'm going to retire soon. Generations behind me are, are getting burned out and tired of working. They're going to retire. Um, there are younger generations that have a different work ethic, um, want to retire sooner than I did, um, there's going to be a shortage of nursing. The distribution on the floors is going to be different. There's going to be more patient care techs. Um, already the patient care techs are doing phlebotomy draws because they can't hire phlebotomists. The work distribution is different. Um, nursing is changing. Yes, thank you so much, Professor. I think this will be the end of the session. Before. Uh, Ending, please, uh, dear participants, it will be better to activate your camera and uh, to take a group of photo. And uh, we will have a last speech from Dr. Asya Darvish. And uh, we will leave and finalize this session. Thanks, dear Professor Milodor. Thank you so much. And from all the colleagues uh, who supported us, uh, Apres to Race team, uh, the Dean of the University and also the International Office and Dr. Manukian. Uh, and thank you both uh, outstanding lecturers who uh, accepted our invitation. Uh, I really enjoyed. And also I want to congratulate you for your uh, new version of uh, the book. Uh, I think uh, Professor Hepta also is 
present in this uh, program. I welcome her and thank you for this attendance. Um, and also thank you because uh, you uh, provided um, uh, an opportunity for me to be a very small co-author in uh, only one chapter. Really appreciate and I, I really thanks. Also, always I um, recommend uh, new books and uh, very beneficial books. One of them is this book, which I bought from uh, 2009. I think the uh, fourth edition, uh, but now this is seventh edition. And page by page I studied and I used it for teaching my students. I don't know you have with you, Dr. Rose, or not, but I, I didn't get it yet. Not but yet. Uh, no, but it came on the Amazon. But I bought another book uh, last time I showed. Um, this is for uh, 2022 for Porso Marion Ball and uh, her colleagues. And this is new version. The last version of this book also I have. So um, I think there are many ways to make yourself uh, up in this uh, regard about nursing informatics. I uh, should send my appreciation to all participants also from different countries. Uh, and I hope to see you uh, in another program again next time. Thank you, Dr. Ross. If Dr. Professor Hepta also wants to speak, I will be so happy. I don't know if she is now uh, here or not. I say thank you very much for the okay. I think it's a great service, and thank you for the contribution that you made to our book. We know that you made it richer, and we're looking forward to your further developments with your nursing informatics program. Thank you. So, thank you so much. <laughs> with your help, with your help, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, dear Professor Dr. Emilio de Rose. Thanks for Tehran University of Medical Sciences for all supports. And thanks for the moderator, Professor Dr. Asedervish. And thank you for your participation. The short course session ended. Be in touch by the WhatsApp group or email. Wish you the best and good luck.